Dennis Lehane, the creator and writer of the Apple TV Plus limited series Blackbird with Taryn Egerton and Paul Walter Hauser based on the true crime memoir by Jimmy Keene. Dennis, I read an interview with you about the show. You, it's, you said historically you don't like serial killers and you don't like prisons. Obviously, Blackbird has both of those things in pretty, pretty large supply. So I guess what was it about Jimmy's memoir initially that you kind of like warmed to to get past maybe that that initial blocker? It, it wasn't anything that I really warmed to until the very end. I came up with the idea that um, right as I was finishing the book, I thought uh, this is an interesting way into the male gaze. This is an interesting way into it's not in the book per se. Like it's in the book, but Jimmy didn't know it, I think. And and Hillel Levin, who co-wrote it, I don't think he knew it. But I thought this is a this is an interesting way of looking at the way that men weaponize um, ob- you know, objectification. Like, right. it, you know, and what I say, I've said a bunch about the show is that everybody objectifies. I don't care who you are. We all objectify. It's that men just seem to weaponize it and a certain type of male. Um, and so I wanted to look at where everybody falls on the spectrum because we're all men. We're all capable of it. Where do we fall on the spectrum? And that, that became the journey that Jimmy goes on. I feel like you've obviously done you've, a lot of your work, I think, has touched on masculinity. Was was this something, though, like the male gaze specifically something you were like looking for and then just kind of happened? Or were you just like, oh, reading? Was it like kind of like a lightning bolt thing for you when you were when you figured it out here? It was in the back of my mind, I think, for many years. I I was struck by. I was struck by conversations I'd had with men about how the, I don't that the objectification is different from from women in the sense that men seem to never be able to turn it off. And I don't mean that in a conscious way. I mean, that's in the place that we're kind of blameless. Now, every other way we're blameful, but, but there's something in the male animal that can never stop that impulse of, of, oh, a potential mate, oh, a potential somebody to, you know, that's that atavistic idea that we're constantly needing to um, uh, reproduce, 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 reproduce. So we, we look and we see, a, a, it doesn't matter the circumstances. You could be in a burning building, in my opinion. A man could be in a burning building. And as he's about to be rescued, he could be like, oh, that firefighter, she's cute. Like, it's just locked into our DNA. And so I started to think like, what is that? I, that's not in women. So what does that mean? And, and I started to, um, I think just sort of ruminate on it over the years. And then when I heard this project, when I, I was listening to the book on tape, when I got near the end, I went, ah, this is because w- w- there's Larry at the end. We get what Larry is, you know, Larry's all the way at the end of the spectrum in terms of misogyny, in terms of hatred of women, in terms of objectification, in terms of weaponizing that. But where's Jimmy fall? Where's, where's Miller fall? You know, the Greg Kinnear character, where's Jimmy's dad fall? You know, and, and where does every other male who I can I can spend more than three minutes with in the story, where do they stand? And that became it for me. Yeah, you have a great I, I, not to spoil it, but the way the series wraps up, obviously, where Jimmy has gone through this uh, kind of ordeal and you kind of have him on the plane with the steward, uh, the flight attendant. I just found that scene really great because you kind of captured like the theme of the show right there in that one sequence. So is that something you're like? Right. I guess like, is that, did you think like, like you're saying, did you think of that like first basically, and then write to that? Or did you kind of like, kind of like just kind of come to that ending, like in that fashion, I guess. Again, not to spoil it, but. So I came, it's not much of a spoiler. I mean, I came to the ending with this idea of Jimmy, a changed man flirting. And, and, and then because he can't help himself, like there's only so much growth we can go through. And and yet he is a changed man at the end and he's never going to be quite the same. I, I think great hero journeys to me are always about the hero goes out, they save society, but they themselves are fundamentally changed and usually not in a good way. Like they, they're, they can never come back from that fight with the dragon or, or whatever it is, you know. Um, so that's Jimmy at the end, but he's still got that instinct. The instinct, right. you know, we tried really hard to get it clear that he was checking her out as she passes him, but we couldn't get it because of the angle. Because we were shooting on this really tight plane and it was almost impossible. Um, but I said, you know, that's 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 a man at the end. You know, he's not capable of totally shutting it off. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it definitely comes through in the performance because Taryn is so charming and engaging 
But then he obviously is so tormented because of this, like the what the Larry's acts and just what he t- says are just so horrifying, obviously. And you have I'm, I'm kind of working backwards here, but you have the great confrontation there in, in the finale, I guess, as well, uh, yeah. where kind of like uh, Jimmy just explodes. And it's so cath- I was a viewer. I was so found that so, uh, so rewarding to see their confrontation kind of uh, play out in that fashion also. So I thought that was like really real well done. But he has a he has a very inconvenient collision with his own humanity. Like he yeah. didn't he did not know at the very beginning of the, of the show, you know, when he's offered this job and they say you could save these women, he says, I don't know. I don't know these women. So I'm not gonna feel responsible if because I say no, he gets out of prison and kills a bunch more. It doesn't have anything to do with me. And by the end, he inconveniently feels that he's part of a human collective, that he's part of humanity. And that he has to do what's right, even though it's not what's sensible. It's not the sensible move. He plays a bad chess move at the end of the show. And that was kind of the point. Mm -hmm. Um, And the real Jimmy did it for different reasons. But the real Jimmy did the same thing. He tipped his hand at the last second (laughs) and uh, and Larry and Larry tripped to it. So I want to ask you, obviously, you're an accomplished, acclaimed writer. A lot of your books have been turned into these incredible movies and stuff. So you're familiar with that process, obviously, like be working on an adaptation of one of your works here. I know Jimmy, I think, is an EP as well. So how did you like how did your past uh, experiences inform how you collaborated with him here on this show? I think what helped so much was having uh, worked on uh, two Stephen King novels, uh, three Stephen King novels, excuse me, in a row. I did Mr. Mercedes, I did End of Watch, which was part of the Mr. Mercedes universe. And then I did The Outsider for HBO. So um, Stephen is, a, is an acquaintance of mine and I and he's also somebody who clearly, you know, he's a giant in the field. And I had to say to him, after a certain point, Stephen, I'm not calling you. After a certain point, I gotta be left alone to do whatever my magic is to this thing. And that's kind of what I said to Jimmy. I'll, I, you, what you'll get from me is full respect for your material and what you want, but I'm not going to be a guy who's going to have somebody looking over my shoulder while I'm writing. I don't do it to the writers who adapt. I didn't do it to Brian Hugelin when he adapted Mr. Gribber. I didn't do it to Lita Calabritas when she adapted Shutter Island. I, you know, here's my phone number. If you need me, call me. Otherwise, I'll leave you alone. So um, my vision was to say, do, will you feel proud of this material will you feel proud will you feel like god i respected your vision if if i feel that's true then yeah and J- would it would i say jimmy was um happy with that approach no it wasn't he had some issues um but i had to go where i had to go and in the end he saw all six episodes over the course of two days and he was really happy with the show so that's all you can ask for yeah I'm hard to hard to knock the show. It's really it's really really good show. I want to ask you about the we talked about Taryn here for a second, but I want to talk about the casting too, especially playing Larry is Paul Walter Hauser. It's just an incredible performance. He's so uh, unbelievably good, and I almost can't imagine anyone else playing the part. I don't even know how you would have. So did you like did you write the part with him in mind? Obviously, he's done a lot of great work in his past, or did you just kind of like how you like how did that come about? And like I like I said, I can't imagine someone else doing it. So. It's hard to to figure out who you else would who else you could have cast. Honestly, here's the irony of all of it. The only character I ever wrote with wrote to was the only actor I ever wrote to was Ray Liotta as uh, as Jimmy's dad. I wanted him. I wanted him from the beginning. The only actor that I got pushback on was Ray Liotta. <laughs> it was so bizarre. It was so weird. Um, they just for some reason there was somebody in the company who didn't think it was a big enough name. It was very strange. Um, so. Uh, that that happened. That was a little weird. But beyond that, Apple TV could not have been more supportive of freedom to cast. Once we got Taryn, they were like, knock yourself out. And so Paul, um, Paul was Taryn and uh, Bradley Thomas, as I did. Bradley Thomas was one of the producers. They were the ones who pushed him. I was I wasn't sure. And so I made I know you say like now. Yeah, sure. The proof's in the pudding. But then what we had was Richard Jewell, I, Tanya. You know, and so I asked Paul to read for me um, and and it shows me, you know, this is a guy who's already headlined a film and he had the modesty and the humility to actually read for me, which I thought was great because I, w- I was searching whether he could go that dark because in Richard Jewell, he doesn't go that dark. Right. The idea is that yeah. he's kind of dopey, but he doesn't go that dark. Mm-hmm. So, um 
he he went that dark. We did we did some really tough scenes, and he blew me away. And I find that one of the advantages of Zoom auditions um, is you're seeing through a lens. Okay. I find them far more. Um, you know, I'm late to the game in terms of casting, and I find them far more instructive than sitting yeah. in a room with somebody because yeah, I can't I, see you on a screen. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, too, because like you said, I think also the, the benefit of the casting is that you're playing off like audiences who know him from Richard Jewell or I, Tanya, where he's like goofy and like kind of likable and here getting I, I, your expectations. Maybe are that if you're watching it without knowing the story and kind of maybe seduced by that initially. Right. And then kind of like, obviously, he's a, a, a playing an absolute monster. So it's like really, uh, really great. But Paul <laughs> can't hide his innate likability. Right. And that's and that's that's something I just uh, feel worked so well to our advantage throughout the show was you're constantly like, because as I was reading the book, I started to doubt that Larry Hall did it. Mm -hmm. And I put that doubt into the show. Right. And, and so uh, as the show progresses, Jimmy starts to, Jimmy's like, wait a minute, I'm laughing with this guy. I'm talking with this guy. We're trading stories about our childhood. He's a killer. Like it just, so, uh, and there were things that Larry, there's a moment in the book where Larry is, uh, Jimmy and Hillel Levin absolutely pin a murder on Larry that I knew he didn't do. Hmm. And, and I researched it and I found out that the, he didn't. And that becomes the journey of uh, Lauren McCauley and Brian Miller in episode three. Right. That's a real case, the, uh, the Raina Rison case. And they pinned it on Larry and in the end he didn't do it. Wow. But he confessed. Uh, it was, it, it, yeah, no, this is a great show. I feel like I talked about this with you for so long because it was it's a fascinating show, Blackbird on Apple TV Plus, but we do have to wrap up. Dennis Lehane, yes. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.